Appreciate everyone joining us this morning, whether in person here in the auditorium or online. We're really grateful to have you here. We look forward to uh, study from the Word together. We're going to be studying today in the book of James, chapter 5, looking in particular at verse, ah, I changed that. It's verse 12, not verse 14. I thought I saved it, but I didn't. Anyway, James 5, verse 12 is a verse that we're going to be looking at. Before we do that, though, I want to remind you about something very, very important. In two weeks, on the 18th, we are going to be taking up a special contribution for Orphans Lifeline International. We've done that now for several years, and you all have been incredibly generous in uh, sharing with this great organization. They presently have 75 orphans homes scattered around the world in places like Haiti and India. And of course, there's a tremendous need to care for these children who have no parents. Also, because of COVID-19, and the fact that it's affected so many people in poorer parts of the world. As we all know, because of what we've learned about what's going on in Honduras and Tegucigalpa and other places, um, there are a lot of people that are just starving to death. They don't have any food. Uh, Orphans Lifeline International has stepped in, and so far they've aided 600 families on top of these orphans' homes in supplying them with food and, and just supplies that they need to live. Um, again, in two weeks, we'll be taking up a special contribution to send to this wonderful organization doing an incredible work. Please keep that in mind, and let's be as generous as we possibly can. Y'all have been wonderful. We've been sending $10,000 at a time to them now for years, and it really makes a difference in the lives of these children. But everything you can, you can give in that regard uh, will really help those who desperately need that help. Um, James 5, verse 12. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Now, if that verse sounds familiar, it's because when you go back to the Sermon on the Mount, in the book of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is going to say something very, very similar to that. And that's why I've put those verses underneath there. Chapter 5, verse 33 of Matthew, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Now, I think it's a legitimate question to ask, why this admonition at this point in the letter? Because James has been talking about all kinds of important issues in our lives. Uh, issues in regard to faith, issues in regard to wisdom, in regard to how we use our tongue. And yet here, he says, above all. Now when you say, above all, about something, what are you stressing? You're saying, this is really, really important, right? Right? I've been talking to you about a lot of stuff that's really important. But I'm telling you, this is even more important above all. And then he starts talking about oaths. But, but I, I want to share with you, I think this admonition is about far more than oath taking. Now, it definitely is about that. Okay, no question about that. And clearly what was going on back at this time was that you had people who would do deals and most people could not write, they couldn't read. And so when they did a deal, it had to be verbal. And so somebody would say, by the temple itself, I swear to you that I will pay you back, blah, 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 for what you're giving to me. And then when the time would come to collect, the guy would say, 
Oh, I don't owe you what you think I owe you because I didn't swear by the gold in the temple. I only swore by the temple. Didn't you catch that? And so I'm really not bound by this oath. And that kind of nonsense went on all the time. People cheating people. Now, well, today we have contracts, right? Well, but you didn't look at subparagraph 4, section 3, line 8 on page 162 of the contract, did you? Because it gives me an out. I mean, that's the kind of game we play today, right? It's in that context, then, that Jesus says, I want your word to be good. In fact, I want you to think about this, because it's important. When do people make or take oaths? And what does an oath imply? Because I think that's why this is placed here. We make oaths when we are assuring people that we're going to tell the truth. You know, there have been a lot of good, sincere people through the years, and bless their hearts, I appreciate them, who would say, I can't put my hand on the Bible and swear that I'll tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God, because Jesus says I, I shouldn't do that. Now, I don't think that's what he's saying, but I appreciate their sincerity. Okay? But, but you take that oath because you're promising, you're assuring people that you're going to tell the truth. The other context in which an oath is usually found is one we just talked about. And that is when there's some kind of a deal being made, and so people put themselves under oath, to promise that they're going to fulfill their part of the deal. And so what this is about, I think, is a brilliant illustration of some foundational stones upon which we build our lives. And he's using oath-taking as an illustration of the importance of these three things. Number one, truth. Because this is all about truth. Number two, it's very much about commitment. It's about, hey, don't let your words be empty. You let your yes be yes, you let your no be no. And thirdly, it is the basis for trust. Because if I can't trust that you're telling me the truth, if I can't trust that you're committed to doing whatever you say you're going to do, we've got problems, don't we? Now, let's break this down and let's look at each one of these, at truth and commitment and trust, and why, why James says, above all, above all, understand how important these are. The importance of truth. Remember in Jesus' trial, when he's brought before Pilate, and Pilate, wishy-washy, trying to find some way to get Jesus off because he knows he's innocent. He knows he's innocent. He knows that Jesus does not deserve to die. He knows the Jews are out to get him. He's very aware of that, all right? But he's also afraid of the Jews. Afraid of the political implications that go with him letting Jesus off because they're threatening him. Well, if you let him go, you're no friend of Caesar's. Well, that's the last thing that man needs. He's a cynic. He's a pragmatist. He's got Jesus back privately conversing with him. And he says to him, ask him, what is true? Now, I guarantee you, he knows what truth is. He does. He just doesn't want to acknowledge it. Because the truth is inconvenient. Because the truth is going to cause him problems. Because the truth could get him kicked out of his position if he carries through with it. He wants to wash his hands of the matter. And so what does he do? He says, well, let's just make truth relative. Okay, because that makes it comfortable, more easy to deal with not really dealing with the truth. Is truth relative? Is, is it undiscoverable? Man, you listen to people today, you listen to professors in a lot of universities, you listen to a lot of, of people out there 
um, doing podcasts and stuff like that, and they're arguing, well, truth, truth's just what you think it is. You can't really know what's true. And honestly, brothers and sisters, that is such nonsense in every way possible. We build our lives on the basis of physical truth. Those people out there saying, well, you can't really know what's true. Hey, is 6 plus 6 12? If you go buy half a dozen eggs, how many eggs are you going to get? Six. If you get five, you're ticked, aren't you? You've been ripped off. You go buy a dozen eggs, they sell them in 18 packs, right? That's six plus six plus six, that's 18 eggs. You expect 18 eggs in that pack, don't you? And that's universal. That's the way it is. These people who are saying, well, you can't know what's true. Well, they can know when they buy a dozen eggs, can't they? Does the sun rise in the east and set in the west? For thousands of years, have people found their way around the sea, across land, rooted in part by the fact that when they get up in the morning, the sun is going to come up in the east, and when they go to bed at night, it's going to set in the west, and they determine direction that way. Yeah. Is that relative? No, it's not. It's true. Red is not green. And if you're confused about that, please don't drive. Okay? Red is not green. Red means stop, green means go. Millions and millions and millions of times a day, people around the world drive or stop based on red being red and green being green, don't they? That's undeniable physical truth. And so the idea that you can't know truth, they will readily admit really doesn't extend to the physical because it has to extend to the physical. Otherwise, you've got complete chaos and disorder. But it also extends to the moral. We construct our lives on a foundation of moral truth. You get some professor, well, you really can't discover truth. You really can't know what truth is. Truth truly is relative. Lie to him and see if he gets upset. Just blatantly lie to him. I guarantee you he'll get upset. It's fascinating to me that liars don't want to be lied to. You ever thought about that? These people that make their living deceiving other people don't want people to deceive them. Truth is really important, isn't it, morally? It's incredibly important. We build our lives around moral truth. It's wrong to steal. I've listened to people trying to justify some of the pillaging that's gone on in some of these riots. Well, that's just repatriation for what was taken previously and that kind of thing. No, that's sophistry. It's wrong to steal. If it's not yours, it's wrong to take it. Cultures around the world, regardless of their religious base, recognize and understand that it's wrong to steal. There are moral absolutes, and we operate them on them every day because if we don't have them, what we've got is chaos. And you don't want chaos, and I don't either. Proverbs 23, 23. Solomon says something incredibly wise, and it's something that needs to be burned into our brains. It really does. By the truth, and sell it not. Buy the truth and sell it not. Why? Because it's precious. It's incredibly important. Why? Well, truth equals reality, right? Isn't truth simply a statement of reality? The sun comes up in the east, that's true, but it's a statement of reality. It's 250 some odd thousand miles to the moon. That's a reflection of reality and it's true. Truth equals reality and that equals certainty. And you want certainty and I do too. We've got to have it. We've got to have it. Our lives are constructed around trying to bring order out of chaos. We need order. Okay? We can't function with disorder. We can't. 
That's why we have rules in our culture. That's why we have rules in our society. That's why we live structured lives, because we need certainty. You destroy truth and you take away certainty. Untruth, brethren, is incredibly dangerous. And by the way, when you talk about untruth, you are therefore implying there is truth, right? Because there can't be a negative of something unless there's a positive that exists. There can't be an untruth unless there's truth. But untruth is incredibly dangerous because, as we're going to see, it leads, it leads to chaos. And it leads to a lack of trust. And oh my, truth and trust go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. And so truth is incredibly important. And so what does James say? Above all, tell the truth. Okay? It's non-negotiable. It's absolutely vital. Secondly, there is the necessity of commitment. But listen to him. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus will go on to say, whatever's more than this is of the evil one. But the idea is, listen, don't exist in the world of maybe, probably, possibly, that kind of thing. Okay? Let your yes be yes, your no be no. James chapter 1 verse 8, remember James laments the man who lacks faith. He says he's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Why? Well, because he won't commit. And if he won't commit, then he's back and forth and he's in and he's out. Revelation 3, verse 16. So because you are lukewarm, Jesus writes to the church at Laodicea, and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What's the problem? The problem is they're not committed. They're not committed. James has already talked about how important it is we be committed, but he's coming back to this now. And he's saying, above all, above all, let your yes be yes, your no be no, be committed to the truth. What kind of life or world can you build on maybe? Can you build on possibly? Can you build on probably? It's an unsure, insecure, chaotic kind of world. That's all it can be. And that's not what we owe each other. That's not what we're owed. Commitment is the glue that holds life together. Do you love this woman? Do you want to spend the rest of your life with her? Then marry her. Don't talk to me about, well, it's just a piece of paper and blah, 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 blah. No, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Commit. One of the reasons the world's in the mess it's in today is because people won't commit. They want to play this game of maybe, this game of possibly, this game of probably. It doesn't work. It never has. And so James says, above all, be committed. What do you think Jesus' last words are? What? Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What is that? Is that not his statement of commitment? Is that not him saying, I am with you, period, count on it, know it, it is absolutely true until I come back. I am with you. On Wednesday night, Steve's been doing a beautiful job of reassuring and talking about this very truth. Okay? That he's with us. And he's going to stand beside us. He is committed to us. That's one of the reasons why you and I can get up in the morning with a smile on our face. Because we know the Lord's with us. He's committed to us. Commitment. It's critical. It's absolutely necessary. And then there is the gift that is trust. Remember, this is so important. Trust is rooted in truth. There's no relationship that can exist for very long without trust. As I've said on many occasions, you may love him, but if you can't trust him, you won't stay with him. 
You may love her, but if you can't trust her, you won't stay with her. Because trust is the anchor in a relationship. I am not in any way denigrating agape or phileo or eros or anything like that. But what I'm saying is you have to be able to trust. You can't have a close friend you don't trust. You find yourself in an impossible situation if you've got a mate you can't trust. If you've got a boss you can't trust at work, if that boss has an employee that he can't trust, he's probably not going to be employed very long, is he? Because no relationship can exist for very long without trust. I really believe our country is in dire peril right now because trust has been destroyed. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, and I hate to say it, but it's true. This country is in bad trouble because we've played too loose and too fast with truth for too long. We've been lied to too much. How many of you trust politicians? Why? Because they'll say whatever's convenient. They'll say whatever they need to say. They'll do whatever they need to do at the time. And their word's not good. Well, you said this five years ago. Yeah, well, that was five years ago, and this is now. And it happens over and over and over again. And what's happened? What's happened is we don't trust our government. That's a cry and shame. And it's dangerous. Brothers and sisters, do you realize how dangerous it is when you can't trust your government? We can't trust the media. Why? Well, because they lie to us all the time. Because they change the narrative. They, they construct and they tell you the news they want you to hear. Not necessarily what's true. And it happens over and over and over and over again to where I know a bunch of you have told me, well, I don't watch the news anymore. And I don't blame you. But listen, when I can't trust what I'm being told to be true, what's true about COVID? What's true? Because what was true yesterday isn't true today. And what's true today may not be true tomorrow, right? Now, there's a few facts that over the months have become pretty clear that are inarguable. But how many, how many projections have been dead wrong? How much science has proved not to be right? How many promises have been made that haven't been kept? Honestly. And what happens when that happens? We quit trusting. And when you can't trust the media and you can't trust the government, you're in a world hurt. And we're in a world hurt, brothers and sisters. I hope you pray for this country every day. I do. Because God's got to intervene in this. I know he's got his hand. I know he's in control. Praise God. That gives me comfort. But we have destroyed trust. We've stomped on it and we've left it in the dirt. And now we're paying the price. Because again, untruth is dangerous. Untruth destroys trust. James is urging Christians to be people who can be trusted. Can people trust you? Do they know that when you tell them something, to the very best of your knowledge, that's the truth? That's the truth. Trust has always been cherished, cherished, and it always will be because it is such an incredibly valuable commodity. So much of our lives is built on truth, and it's because of truth that we trust. <coughs> Go back to the Old Testament and, and think for just a second with me. Here's Joseph. A Hebrew shepherd kid living in Egypt as a slave in a country that despises shepherds. And Potiphar will put him over his household and entrust him with everything he's got. And then Pharaoh will put him over the country and entrust him with everything he's got and make him one of the most powerful men in the world. You understand that? When he assumes that position, he's one of the most powerful men in the world. 
Why? Because, man, you can trust that kid. You can trust that young man. You could trust him. And they did. And that's invaluable. Daniel. Daniel survives. He's a Jew. He's a Jew in Babylon. And he rises to be one of the great advisors to the king. And then when Babylon is taken over by the Medo-Persians, they don't kill Daniel. Daniel shows up again as a valued advisor to a Medo-Persian king. That doesn't happen. You kill off everybody who was ruling previously had anything to do with power. You don't keep them around. They keep Daniel around. Why? Because, man, you can trust him. Because he was an honest man who did the right thing always. And the Babylonians knew that and respected it. And the Medo-Persians knew that and respected it. Trust has always been honored. Trust has always been cherished. It provides order. It does in the midst of chaos. Godfather 2 is considered by many to be one of the greatest movies ever made. It's a parable. And at the end of the parable, it's fascinating to me that you find Michael Corleone, who's now the godfather, in the last scene, he's sitting completely by himself, totally isolated. And in the scenes leading up to that moment, you find that essentially he has either alienated everybody or has completely cut off relationships with everybody. His brother, his adopted brother, Tom, who has been by his side through this horrible mess, he's admitted to Tom he doesn't trust him. He's been having people follow Tom to see if Tom is loyal to him. He doesn't trust anybody anymore. Why? Because Corleone is fabulously wealthy, incredibly powerful, absolutely ruthless, and has lied and murdered his way to the top and has nobody. And there's the moral of the movie. He's got nobody. Every relationship that man had has been destroyed. What will a man gain if he gains a whole world and what? Loses his own soul. Loses what's really important. Above all, above all, truth, commitment, and trust. Incredibly important. Now, James ends with a warning, and I can't ignore the warning because the warning's important. He's sticking this warning on here for a reason, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Why? Listen to these two passages. Here's Jesus talking to the Jews, John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. What does Jesus think of the ultimate liar? Is there a stronger rebuke found in Scripture than this one right here? Revelation 21, verse 8. Woo. New Testament's coming to an end. The next to the last chapter in the book. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and what? All liars. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Brothers and sisters, what use does God have for liars? None. Is the truth important to him? What sent Jesus to the cross? Bunch of liars. What causes the mess in this world? Lying. 
lying. Where would this world be if people just told the truth? They didn't lie. What kind of trust level would there be in this world if you knew that people always told you the truth? Do you understand why God despises? He despises lying. He wants no part of it because he sees the damage that it does. And so, above all, truth and commitment and trust are absolutely vital as children of God. Those are the things that characterize our lives. And it certainly characterizes our God. Why did Jesus come? He came because we're all sinners. And he doesn't lie to us about that, does he? He doesn't soft soap it. He doesn't say, well, you know, no. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have sinned. Nobody's not, nobody's not a sinner. Why'd he come? As Mark talked about, to pay the price for our sins, didn't he? You talk about commitment. Man, there's commitment. I'll give my life so that you can live. And as we said, once he saved, right before he leaves this earth, I'm going to be with you always to the end of the world. I'm I'm, I'm here for you. You can trust me, and you can. And this morning, if you're willing to believe his truth, you're willing to confess that he's the son of God, you're willing to put on your Lord in baptism, willing to become a part of his family, if you're willing to commit your life to him as he commits his to you, you can have that relationship with him that will extend right into eternity. We can help you in any way. Come while we stand and while we sing.